So now, let's go to the one of the most important parts of pre-stressing activity, which is the pre-stressing reinforcement itself. So we continuously hear pre-stressing reinforcement all throughout our discussion because it is it plays actually a vital role or major 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 role on pre-stressing activity. So just to recap what happens in pre-stressing, so say for example, we have here a pre-casting bed with vertical bulkheads at the ends or vertical walls. Uh, there will be uh, steel reinforcements that will be set up here together with the pre-stressing reinforcement, which is the which is our topic to the, for this the, uh, for this part of the of our discussion. So the pre-stressing reinforcement will be placed at a certain distance e from the centroid of the concrete element. So after the pre-stressing reinforcement is placed on its proper place, a hydraulic jack will be put on it with the purpose of imposing what we call jacking force to the pre-stressing reinforcement. So that, that jacking force tends to impose a what we call tension force all throughout the length of the pre-stressing reinforcement. So jacking in uh, actual looks something like this. So the, so the man is uh, applying a jacking force on the pre-stressing reinforcements here individually. So as, as, as we discussed before, a while ago, we can uh, pre-stress several pre-stressing reinforcements all at once or simultaneously. But it will require a large capacity hydraulic jack. So this is what we call hydraulic jack. So that hydraulic jack will tend to pull this uh, pre-stressing reinforcement and because of that, a jacking force is being applied or being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement. So due to that uh, pulling, a jacking force uh, results that is uh, being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement all throughout its length. So after that, after the pre-stressing reinforcement is pulled, thereby applying or imposing a what we call jacking force after that activity the concrete will be poured to the uh, form works and then after some time when the concrete already achieved uh, enough strength to resist that pre-stressing force or compressive force that will be applied by the pre-stressing reinforcement the pre-stressing pre-stressing reinforcement will be cut after the concrete uh, achieved enough strength. So when the pre-stressing reinforcement is cut, the tendency for the pre-stressing reinforcement, since it is elastic, and since it uh, elongated because of the pulling that the hydraulic jack imposed to it, the natural tendency of the pre-stressing reinforcement is to go back to its original length. So take note again, the length of the pre-stressing reinforcement is smaller than what you, you are seeing here. So the natural behavior of steel, the pre-stressing reinforcement, it tends to uh, go back to that original length, which is, which is shorter than what you are seeing here. But the concrete, again, prevents it from doing so. And because of that, because concrete is preventing the pre-stressing reinforcement to go back to its original length, the pre-stressing reinforce, reinforcement uh, is imposing a what we call compressive force to the concrete element. So if you want to, uh, and because of that, because of that compressive uh, force being applied by the pre-stressing reinforcement to the concrete element, the beam or the concrete element tends to bend upward. So when it bends, uh, when it bends uh, upward, it will look something like a simply supported beam. And after that, since uh, it will be a simply supported beam already, uh, that will force the concrete element to support itself, or it will force the concrete element to support its own weight. And then after that, the service load will be applied to the concrete element. 
So if we want to investigate what what is actually happening or being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement at this particular time, or actually in any any time or any stage of the pre-stressing activity, we just have to cut the concrete element somewhere on its length. So say for example, we have cut it here, somewhere here, on this particular location. So we can see that since we cut it there, on that particular location, we can see the force acting on the pre-stressing reinforcement, which is obviously must be a tension force because again, the pre-stressing reinforcement is in the state of elongation or elongated state. And since it, it, it is still elongated, the force that is acting on it is or must be a tension force like that. So that is actually what we call the uh, initial, or no, no, that, not, not actually the initial. In general, we call that the pre-stressing force. So that is the force being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement inside the concrete element. So the magnitude of that pre-stressing force acting inside the concrete element is not actually constant all throughout the loading stages that we have mentioned. Actually, it diminishes in value. So why is that? So the reason for that is because of the high creep and shrinkage losses in concrete. So because of that, because of those losses uh, in concrete due to high creep and shrinkage, the tendency is the, val the value or the magnitude of this pre-stress force tends to diminish or reduce. And that reduced pre-stressing force magnitude is what we call effective pre-stress or effective pre-stressing force. And that effective pre-stressing force or, or effective pre-stressing can be achieved by using very high strength steels in the range of 270,000 PSI or more. So we usually require a high strength steel in as, as a pre-stressing reinforcement in any pre-stress concrete element. So why is that? Why do we require high strength steels? In, uh, in any pre-stressing activity. Such high-stress steels are able to counterbalance these losses in the surrounding concrete and have adequate leftover stress levels to sustain the required pre-stressing force. So that is the main reason why we usually require the pre-stressing reinforcement to be a high-strength steel because we want it to have enough or adequate uh, leftover stress after the losses uh, occurred on it. So actually we have the, uh, uh, many more uh, causes of uh, losses in pre-stress force or pre-stress magnitude and we will discuss all of those other uh, source of losses later on on the next or the following chapters. The magnitude of norm, normal pre-stress losses can be expected to be in the range of 35,000 to 60,000 PSI. So usually, the magnitude, the magnitude of the pre-stress loss that is being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement uh, uh, is in the range of 35,000 to 60,000 PSI. So just imagine how, how much is that loss being experienced by the pre-stress or pre-stressing reinforcement. And imagine as well, how much uh, stress capacity will be left to the pre-stressing reinforcement after uh, it is reduced by this high high magnitude of pre-stress loss? So just imagine what will be the leftover stress and the pre-stressing reinforcement after it is diminished by this amount of uh, pre-stress loss. The initial pre-stress would thus have to be very high on the order of 180,000 to 220,000 PSI. Therefore, normal steels will, with yield strengths of 60,000 PSI would have little pre-stressing le stress left after losses. So that is the main reason why we usually require high strength steels to be to act as pre-stressing reinforcement, mainly because of the occurrence of pre-stress losses, which usually have a very high magnitude ranging from 35,000 to 60,000 PSI. So, uh, in order to counter that pre-stress losses that will be experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement, 
we we want the uh, the capacity of the pre-stressing reinforcement to very high so that we can uh, pre-stress it on the initial jacking force that we have conducted before. We want it to experience a very high uh, stress so that if it if ever it if it will lose the, its uh, pre-stress uh, or should I say uh, we want it to have a very high uh, strength because we want it to experience a very high uh, pre-stress so why is that because uh, if the scenario of uh, pre-stress losses will occur or will be experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement with a very high magnitude if ever it will experience pre-stress losses we want the pre-stressing reinforcement to still have adequate leftover stress after uh, pre-stress losses occurred on it so usually we want it to be uh, initially pre-stress uh, on the order of 180,000 to 220,000 PSI so that if ever say for example the initial uh, pre-stress being experienced by the pre-stress reinforcement is say for example 220,000 PSI and then uh, after some time it experienced pre-stress losses of magnitude say for example uh, 60,000 PSI so therefore it will diminish by this magnitude so what will be the leftover stress that will be left on the pre-stressing reinforcement that will that it will eventually transfer to the concrete we want that pre-stress force that will be transferred to the concrete as high as possible so what will be that magnitude that will be left to this pre-stressing reinforcement if it will if it will have a uh, any or uh, if if it will have initial pre-stress of 220,000 PSI and then will experience a pre-stress loss of magnitude of 60,000 PSI so obviously the stress that will be left is uh, 160,000 PSI so still a very high pre-stress magnitude so that 160,000 PSI is the pre-stress that will be transferred by the, by the pre-stressing reinforcement to the concrete element so that is the main reason why we want the pre-stressing reinforcement to have a very high uh, strength or capacity to counterbalance or counteract the effects of pre-stress losses so because of that because of that uh, uh, scenario the normal steels with yield strengths of 60,000 psi would have little pre-stressing stress left after losses so imagine if we will just use a normal pre-stressing reinforcement here with a yield strength of 60,000 psi so say for example we stress out the pre-stressing reinforcement to a maximum value of uh, 60,000 psi which is equal to the yield strength of the uh, pre-stressing reinforcement although in reality we don't usually do that we don't usually pre-stress the, re the pre-stressing reinforcement to its uh, maximum capacity usually we put an allowance like for example if the if it's, if its capacity is 60,000 psi we will just uh, stress it out at up to say for example up to 50,000 psi or 40,000 psi depending on the required safety factor so imagine if the if the capacity of the pre-stress uh, pre-stressing reinforcement here is just 60,000 psi and then it will experience a pre-stress loss of say for example uh, 50,000 psi so can you imagine what will be the stress or the yeah, the stress level or the stress magnitude that will be left out on the pre-stressing reinforcement after the pre-stress losses occurred on it so there will be just a 10,000 psi uh, pre-stressing uh, or there will be just a 10,000 pre-stress magnitude that will be left on the uh, uh, pre-stressing reinforcement with a capacity of 60,000 PSI after the pre-stress losses occurred which has a magnitude of 50,000 PSI so imagine uh, that very small pre-stress magnitude which is 10,000 PSI is the only magnitude or the only pre-stress that will be transferred to the concrete element so actually that is not enough to 
to counterbalance the effect of the applied loads to the concrete element. That is not enough. We don't we don't usually that's why we don't usually use normal strength uh, steels in pre-stressing activities because we want again because we want the pre-stressing reinforcement to have adequate or enough leftover stress levels after it experience pre-stress losses. So you have to remember that that is the main reason why we usually require high strength steels as pre-stressing reinforcement. So there are different types of pre-stressing reinforcement and it can be in the form of single wires like this one. It can be in the form of strands composed of several wires twisted to form a single element like this one. And it can, uh, it can be in the form of uh, high strength bars. So these are the uh, different types of pre-stressing reinforcement that we usually use as, again, as a pre-stressing reinforcement. So there are actually uh, some types, some special types of this. Of There are some special types of each of this uh, type of pre-stressing reinforcement. So like for example, for the case of wires, Usually, we have what we call un uncoated stress relief or low relaxation wires that we usually use in the industry for pre-stressing operations. So later on, we will discuss all of this uh, further. For the case of the uh, strands, we, we, we usually have what we call uncoated stress relief strands or, and low relaxation strands and in the case of bars we usually have what we call uncoated high strength steel bars so we will discuss each of this so now let's go to the first two the stress relief and low relaxation wires and strands so what are those stress relief wires are called drawn single wires conforming to ASTM A4421 and the uh, Stress relief strands conform to ASTM A416. So for the wires, the ASTM specification must be ASTM A421. Standard specification for uncoated stress relief steel wire for pre-stress concrete. And then for strands, we usually refer to ASTM A416. The standard specification for steel strand uncoated 7 wire for pre-stress concrete. To maximize the steel area of the 7 wire strand for any nominal diameter, the standard wire can be drawn through a die to form a compact, compacted strand as shown in the figure. Where is the figure? Here, with specifications given on ASTM A779. So usually this strand, which has, which has this form, composed of 7 wires twisted uh, together to form a strand, Usually, to uh, to maximize the steel area, we usually uh, draw drawn this through a die through a die to form a compacted strand, which is like this. So can you imagine? We just uh, compacted this strand to maximize the steel area, and it will look something like this. But uh, this type, or uh, yeah, this type of uh, strand must be in accordance to ASTM A779, which is the standard specification for steel strand 7 wire uncoated compacted stress relief for pre-stress concrete. So this is actually a form of compacted strand with the purpose of maximizing the steel area. So this is actually the stress strain curve for high strength steels. So actually, this is just almost the same to the non-pre-stressing reinforcement, reinforcement because obviously they are both steel. But the main difference is the steels that are used as pre-stressing reinforcement usually have high capacity or high strength. Usually have uh, high yield points, just like what is shown here. So usually, the grades or the strengths of non-pre-stressing reinforcement uh, ranges from 40,000 40, psi to 
80,000 PSI. But the, for the case of pre-stressing reinforcement, you usually require it to have a strength of, uh, say for example, 160,000 PSI to as, as much as 270,000 PSI. So if you grab the strength, uh, stress strain curve of those different uh, grades of steel, it will be something like this. So this is for this will be the graph for uh, grade 160 alloy bar. So this is for bar, for for wire. This will be the graph, and for strands, this it, this will be the graph. So if you want to find the modulus of elasticity of the pre-stressing strand, it will it usually have this. Uh, it will it usually has this value for the wire. The modulus of elasticity of that pre-stressing steel, steel wire is equal to 29,000, 10 to the 6 to PSI. And for the bar, 27, uh, 27 times 10 to the 6 PSI. So wire 29, 29 times 10 to the 6 PSI, strand 27.5 times, times 10 to the 6 PSI. For bar, 27 times 10 to the 6 PSI. So maybe that will be, that will come in handy uh, later on. So now let's go for the for the bars. So so what we have discussed here are the wires and strands, the the stress relief and low relaxation wires and strands. So now let's go to the bar, which is actually specifically the high tensile strength pre-stressing bars. So these are either smooth or deformed and must conform to ASTM A7. So if you can imagine, these uh, these uh, are just actually like the normal steel reinforcing bar, but uh, in case of if it if it will be used as pre-stressing pre reinforcement, it can be either smooth or deformed, and must conform to ASTM A722 standard specification for uncoated high-strength steel bars for pre-stressing concrete. So it can have a deformations, just like what I've shown a while, a while ago on the case of non-processing reinforcement. Or it can have no deformations. It can be a smooth bar only, which will be used as pre-stressing reinforcement. Stress relieving is achieved by heating the bar to an appropriate temperature, generally below 500 degrees Celsius. So you can make the pre-stressing bar uh, stress relieved by uh, subjecting it to a temperature below 500 degree Celsius. Though essentially the same stress relieving process is employed for bars as for strands, the tensile strength of pre-stressing bars has to be a minimum of 150,000 PSI with a minimum yield strength of 85% of the ultimate strength for smooth bars and 80% for deformed bars. So again, just like what I have shown, what I what I have shown before, this is the graph of the stress strain curve for uh, a bar, grade sixty, uh, grade one sixty alloy bar. So I just copied the stress strain curve on the previous slide, just to show the stress strain curve for a bar. Still relaxation. What do you mean by still relaxation? Actually, this is actually a uh, a problem which is naturally being experienced by steels, especially steels that are pre-stressed or that are used as pre-stressing reinforcement. So what is steel relaxation? It is the loss of pre-stress when the wires or strands are subjected to essentially constant strain. So actually steel relaxation is just a scenario wherein the pre-stressing reinforcement uh, loses uh, a certain magnitude of uh, pre-stressing uh, force or pre-stress or, or pre-stress itself. It loses uh, some some magnitude of uh, pre-stress due to steel relaxation. So that is a actually not, that is actually a natural 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 uh, phenomena that is being experienced by steels especially steels that are subjected to essentially constant strain so steel relaxation is actually identical to creep in concrete except that 
creep is a change in strain, as we have mentioned a while ago, whereas still relaxation is a loss in still stress. Where time, where T is equal to time in hours after pre-stressing, the loss of stress due to relaxation in stress, I mean stress relief wires and strands can be evaluated from the expression this. So we, we actually have a way to compute the magnitude of the stress that will be lost or when, on, on the uh, pre-stressing reinforcement when, is, when it is subjected to essentially constant strength. So the formula will be this wherein the FPI prime is the stress on the tendon or the pre-stressing reinforcement at time T, which must be in hours after jacking, after the jacking operation. So you have to count how many hours after the jacking operation uh, uh, already uh, lasted. And then uh, check the pre-stressing force or pre-stress or the pre-stress, check the pre-stress uh, being experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement at that particular time t after uh, jacking, hours after jacking. But on this formula, the ratio of FPI prime over FPY, which is the yield strength of the pre-stressing reinforcement, must be greater than or equal to 0 0.55. And FPY must be uh, approximately equal to uh, 0 0.8 of the ultimate strength of the pre-stressing reinforcement for pre-stressing bars, 0 0.85 of the ultimate uh, strength of the pre-stressing reinforcement for stress relief strands, and 0 0.90 of the ultimate strength of the pre-stressing reinforcement for low relaxation strands. It is possible to decrease stress relaxation loss by subjecting strands that are initially stressed to 70% of their ultimate strength to temperatures of 20 degrees to 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius for an extended time in order to produce a permanent elongation, which is a process called stabilization. So usually, we want to actually we, we want to reduce the magnitude of the pre-stress loss that will be experienced by the pre-stressing reinforcement, especially the still relaxation. And in the case in this case in this in the case of still relaxation, if you want to decrease its magnitude, the losses that will be uh, occurring because of still relaxation, if you want to decrease it, we can subject the strands that are initially stressed to 70% of their ultimate strength to temperatures 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius for an extended uh, period of time uh, to produce a permanent elongation on the uh, pre-stressing reinforcement or the strand, which is actually what we call uh, stabilization. The pre-stressing steel does produce is term low relaxation steel and has relaxation stress loss that is 25% of that normal stress relief mm -hmm. steel. So the product of subjecting the strength or the pre-stressing reinforcement to temperatures of 20 degrees Celsius to 100, deg 100 degrees Celsius is actually what we call low relaxation steel. And low relaxation steel has relaxation stress loss that is just 25% of that of normal stress relief steel. So from being stress relief, uh, we we uh, subjected the strand or the pre-stressing reinforcement to temperature of 20 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius to make it a low relaxation steel because we want because low relaxation steel has relaxation stress loss that is just 25% of that normal stress relief steel. So, nor, so mm -hmm. stress relief steel are have actually a larger magnitude of relaxation uh, losses compared to low relaxation steel. So as you can see here. The st relaxation stress loss due to, I mean, the, re the relaxation stress loss on low relaxation steel is just 25% of that of normal stress relief steel. So that is actually how many? 75% reduction on the relaxation stress loss. So you can achieve that. You can achieve that by subjecting the strength or the pre-stressing reinforcement to temperature of 2200 degrees Celsius for an extended period of time so that you can produce a permanent elongation on the strength or the pre-stressing reinforcement. And again, that, is, that, process, that process is called stabilization. 
the expression for stress relaxation still ah sorry the expression for stress relaxation in low relaxation pre-stressing stills is so we have a uh, expression to find the uh, still relaxation or or uh, so, uh, I mean we have an expression for finding the loss due to uh, still relaxation in low relaxation uh, still using this formula. So actually, it, uh, the same definition applies to this. So the same definition lang dito. Especially the limits on the ratio of FPI prime over FPY, the yield strength of the uh, still. So this, this is for low relaxation, pre-stressing, still. This is for stress relief, uh, wires and start, uh, stress relief wires and strands. So just like in the case of concrete, we want our pre-stressing reinforcement to have enough uh, strength so that, uh, uh, I mean, we want our pre-stressing reinforcement to have uh, enough uh, leftover strength in order for it to serve its int intended purpose, which is, again, to carry loads, which are the dead loads, like superimposed dead loads, live loads, etc., etc. So in order for us to assure or to make sure that our pre-stressing reinforcement will not be overstressed, because we don't we don't want it to experience uh, so much stress, obviously, because it will have a deteriorating effect or det det or detrimental effect to its strength, obviously. If the strength of the pre-stressing reinforcement will be reduced or diminished, it will actually have an effect to the overall strength of the pre-stress concrete. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want our pre-stressing reinforcements uh, to experience uh, uh, overstress, overstressing. We don't want it to, to be overstressed. And in order for us to make sure that our pre-stressing reinforcement will not experience overstressing the, the codes uh, specify a what we call maximum permissible stresses that can be experienced or applied to pre-stressing reinforcement so if you will refer to the ACI code ACI 318M-14 and refer to section 20.3.2.5 you can see there the permissible tensile stresses uh, in pre-stress reinforcement so you can see here the uh, maximum permissible tensile stress obviously tensile stress because uh, the, the force acting on the or the stress acting on the pre-stressing reinforcement, reinforcement is actually uh, tenso, uh, tension or tensile stress so that tensile stress must be limited to a maximum value of this if you will refer on ACI code or if you will refer on our local code the NSCP you can actually see almost similar to this because again we know that our local code uh, adapted the international code and if you will refer to ASHTO 2012 uh, it has a somehow different way of uh, limiting the stress on the pre-stressing reinforcement so you can just refer to this uh, you can just refer to ASHTO 2012 on this table in particular to know the limiting stresses that can be experienced by pre-stressing reinforcement. So the stress in the pre-stressing reinforcement must not uh, exceed the values specified on the codes specified on the ACI, NSCP, and ASHTO 2012. So there you go. We already discussed the different properties of pre-stressing reinforcement. So we are actually done on all of our goal for this discussion. So just to give you a recap or summary of the of our discussion for today, uh, we have studied that, or, or we have learned that pretensioning is tensioning the tendon prior to casting the section. So that is the key word there. Uh, tensioning prior to casting. Uh, while post-tensioning is tensioning the tendon after the concrete has been cast and has, has achieved the major portion of its strength. So the keyword is after or post-tensioning. Pre-tensioning prior or before, post-tensioning after. 
before casting and after casting the concrete. We also learned about jacking systems, which are the manner in which the pre-stressing force is transferred to the steel tendon. So we have seen that we can uh, jack pre-stressing reinforcement individually or simultaneously. Although if you want it, if you want to jack it simultaneously, we uh, we usually need a uh, large capacity hydraulic. And then we have learned that concrete is a major cons uh, constituent of all precious concrete elements. Hence, its strength and long-term endurance have to be achieved through proper quality control and quality assurance at the production stage. So we have seen that concrete is actually one, one actually the most important part of pre-stressing or pre-stress concrete. So since it, it is that important, we need to make sure that uh, it will attain it will attain its strength and long-term endurance. So how can we uh, be assured that it will attain its strength and long-term endurance? So we have to uh, strictly monitor the production of concrete through proper quality control and quality assurance. So we, al we also learned about the different properties of hardened concrete, which is divided into categories. The first one is the short-term or instantaneous uh, properties which are actually strength and compression or compressive strength, the tensile strength, the shear strength, and the stiffness which is measured by the modulus of elasticity. And the other category is the long-term properties which are creep and shrinkage. We also learned about non-pre-stressing reinforcement which consists of bars, wires, and welded wire fabric all of which are manufactured in accordance with ASTM standards. So the different properties of reinforcing steel are Young's modulus, E sub, e sub S, the yield strength FY, the ultimate strength FU, steel, the steel grade designation, and the size or diameter of the bar or wire. And then lastly, we have studied about the different types of restressing reinforcement commonly used in the industry, which are the uncoated stress relief or low re relaxation wires, the uncoated stress relief strands and low relaxation strands, low relaxation strands, and lastly, the uncoated high strength steel bars. So that is the overall summary of our discussion. So that's all for this discussion. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, clarifications, and any other concern, please do not hesitate to contact me via Canvas, Canvas Discussion. You can contact me there. You can post your concern, concern there. You can post your concern, concern there. Or you can message me on Facebook Messenger. You can just search my name, Adam Suresa Nuevo, Junisio. Or you can just email me via Google via gmail at ahrgenisio.c at tip.edu.ph So that's all for this uh, meeting. Thank you for listening and have a good day.